cataractcoach.com, why did we get a refractive surprise with guest surgeon Dr. Giuliano Vescovi from Ara Cruz, Brazil? Now, importantly, all these different methods indicated that a 22.5 Doppler lens would be just about perfect between Plano and minus a quarter. But the patient ended up about minus 0.75. Let's figure out why. So, starting off the case here for cataract surgery, using the keratome to make a main incision at the limbus and the edge of the clear cornea. I like how the limbal vessels have uh, barely been nicked there. That's going to mean that incision will heal beautifully with great long-term stability. And a paracentesis has been made as well. If you look at the cornea, you can see that a stencil or mark has been used to outline the capsorexis. Here comes a viscoelastic to get a nice fill in the anterior chamber. A little squirt of bound salt solution on the cornea. And that's a pretty nice red reflex. So now a little bit more viscoelastic. So maybe a soft shell technique there. Initially a little bit of a dispersive viscoelastic followed up by a cohesive. That's a good example of the soft shell technique. And again, you can see the outline that was made on the corneal epithelium to give us a guide for the capsulorexis. A cystotome is being used to start the capsulorexis and bring that around. And that looks great. In fact, it looks like we're going to use the cystome to complete the capsulorexis. This is a technique that a lot of more advanced surgeons do use. There's a lot of control in using just the cystotome to create the capsulorexis, but this technique does require some practice. So clearly Dr. Vescovi is a very accomplished surgeon and does a beautiful rexus with just a cystotome. There you go, that looks great. I'm watching this video for the first time with you, so my narration and my input here is coming fresh. So a little bit more balanced salt solution on the cornea. There's a very nice outline of the capsulorexis. And now balanced salt solution on a blunt cannula is used for hydrodissection. There's a good fluid wave. And another good fluid wave. And another wave. And even another. So maybe a little bit of partial hydrodelineation there as well. And again, this step of surgery is important. If it does spin in the capsular bag, if you get a complete hydrodissection, it really does make nucleus removal a lot easier. That little bit of a golden ring is a hydrodelineation. That looks great. And now a little more. Ah, that's my technique. Again, that's a very advanced move, which is a little extra viscoelastic there in the center to protect that endothelium. Because when, when you do the hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, you can lose a substantial amount of the viscoelastic. So just implanting a little more is helpful. And there we can see now we have complete rotation of the nucleus in the capsular bag. That's really going to facilitate the nucleus removal. So let's see what technique we're using here. So chopper going in one hand, phaco probe in the other. And let's see, it looks like a uh, smaller 2.2 to 2.4 millimeter phaco tip and sleeve. So maybe a smaller incision here, a groove down the middle. There's a nice trench being made, another groove, and another groove, and another one. And that looks like it's pretty reasonable depth. Here comes our chopper. Looks like a, a typical chopper, standard style, a little bit of a ball tip on the end. And then seeing if we can split the nucleus in two halves. There you go. That looks pretty good. Make sure the crack is propagated fully, rotating the nucleus a little bit more. Cleaning up some of the cortex here to improve the view. And a little vacuum to hold the piece to bring it up. So it looks like grooving it to split it into two halves. And then we're gonna bring up each half here. So the higher vacuum settings. So likely here, higher vacuum, higher flow. And so this is not a very dense lens, so you gotta be careful because we don't want to go through the nuclear half and hit the capsular bag. So at first, it looks like we're going to trench another one here. So maybe more like a divide and conquer now. Another little groove there and split that split beautifully. 
So now going back to a higher vacuum setting, that first quadrant can be pulled out of the capsule bag quite nicely and aspirated relatively quickly. The second piece comes out as well, and the rest of this should follow quite nicely. Of course, when we take out the nucleus, taking out that first piece is usually the toughest because it's the tightest fit. Once we've removed the first piece, the rest of the nucleus comes up relatively easily because there's more room, more maneuver, maneuverability for us. So again, just vacuum only to engage it. And you notice how once the piece is engaged, Dr. Vescovi pulls the probe and the nuclear piece back into the center of the eye. The safest working spot in the eye is at the iris plane in the center of the eye. And that way you're about halfway between the corneal apex and on the front and, and deep in the eye, about um, halfway between the center of the posterior capsule. And that's the ideal spot. So iris plane is great. Here's the epinuclear shell being brought up with just vacuum and then teasing that whole shell out of the bag and it can be aspirated relatively easily. So again, there's an epinuclear shell here because there was some hydrodelineation to split it apart. That looks great. So the nucleus is out with, a, of course, a bare minimum amount of phaco energy. This patient will certainly have a clear cornea the very next morning. And now it's time for a little more, looks like more viscoelastic there. There we go. And time for cortex removal. Let's see the technique here. So when we're thinking about eye well calculations, remember the main thing that we have to figure out and the most challenging thing is what's the effect of lens position? How far in the eye will the eye well sit? And that's hard to predict sometimes. So here doctors opening up the paracentesis just a little bit more. If we have a nice intact caps rex as like we have in this case, that will overlap the optic for 360 degrees, that helps tremendously in determining the effect of lens position. So here we've got a Simcoe cannula being used inside the eye to strip away the lens cortex. Again, the Simcoe cannula is a double lumen cannula that irrigates at the same time that it aspirates. And that's developed by Dr. Bill Simcoe uh, many decades ago. And this certainly works very well, nice and clean. And that's stripping out just beautifully. And you can see the initial hydrodissection was excellent, so there's very little material left on the capsule bag. And now through the main incision, you've got to be a little bit more careful through the main incision because the main incision may be a little bit larger and it may leak a little bit. But an advanced surgeon like this is able to pivot with the incision and have a very nice outcome. So stripping away the last bit of cortex now. So with a clean capsular bag and a nice uh, uh, capsular axis, we're going to have a nice overlap for 360 degrees. It'll hold the IOL optic in good position. So in this situation, we should have a very good result from our lens calculations. And it's also helpful to know that all four different methods of lens calculation gave the same answer. So with four different formulas giving the same answer, that gives you a little bit more peace of mind that this is probably the right choice. If you had all the different formulas disagreeing, that'd make it a tougher choice for the surgeon. Now looking at the side, you may ask, what about, what about an aphic refraction or intraoperative aberrometry? And I ask you here, would it make a difference? I mean, are you sure you can measure this eye in the aphic state now? But using that aphic refraction as one of the uh, steps in calculation can be helpful, but it's, again, I don't know if it'll supplant neat using the axial length, K values, enter chamber depth, etc., cetera, to, to do our actual lens calculations. Maybe it's good to supplement it, but not to supplant it. So caps or bags, nice and empty, looks great. Time to fill it up with viscoelastic. Nice, good fill of our caps or bag here. And then we're going to implant a lens. So Dr. Vescovi has already told me the model of the lens. It's not a lens that we have in the USA, so I've never used this lens. So slightly enlarging the incision, and the lens will be implanted shortly. In the USA, we don't have these trifocal lenses available just yet. Hopefully in the relatively near future, we will have FDA approval of these devices.
So squirting the cornea, getting a nice clear view. And now it's time to get that lens and we'll implant it. So looks like the surgeon himself is probably loading the lens. And that's why I have a little break here in the video. For our residents who are in their training, we certainly ask all of them to load their lenses. And even if you watch some of my videos, if I use a different lens than my scrub tech is used to, oftentimes I'll load it. So here we go. Let's take a look. Here's the injector. There comes the lens. We're verifying it under the microscope. Let's go back to the eye. And here comes our lens. Let's see. So fixating the eye with the chopper, I like that technique. There's the lens injector. Start to advance and deliver the lens. Let's see what it looks like. So there's the injector tip inside the eye and advancing the lens down the plunger. Here it comes. There's the leading haptic and it looks like an acrylic material. There's the optic. And here comes a trailing haptic. So that looks good. And now it'll be placed in the capsule bag. And of course, a lens like this, we want to make sure it's very well centered in the patient's visual axis as well. So getting the eye well completely in the capsule bag, there it goes. There's that overlap of the rexus, that looks great. So this is an ideal case. The rest of the case, I'm sure, goes beautifully without any complications. The patient had a beautiful post-op course, lens very well centered, no other issues. And we went back and did an analysis of all the calculations and all the data. And what was it that caused this patient to have a refractive surprise? Again, the patient ended up more myopic than anticipated. The 22.5 Doppler lens was implanted in the eye, and the patient, instead of being Plano, the patient was minus 0.75, which means the eye will power was too high by about one diopter. So perhaps a 21.5 would have been a better choice um, in order to hit the target of Plano. Why wasn't this predicted by any case? Well, in this situation, despite a beautiful surgery and zero complications, this patient ends up having a final lens position that's a little more anterior in the eye. So the eye well sits a little closer to the cornea. As a result, it needs to be a little lower in power. So if we have our same 22.5 Doppler lens and the lens is sitting a little bit too anterior, just based on the patient's anatomy and patient's healing, then we'll get this myopic surprise. So in summary, everything was calculated correctly. There were no mistakes here. The surgery, as you can see in this unedited video, went beautifully, so no issue with the surgery. The issue is, this is just one of those outliers. Even with the best of lens calculation methods, about 95% accuracy is what we can achieve. That's with the best methods. Most surgeons are far less. And 95% means one out of 20 patients are gonna be a refractive surprise. And this is one of those. Luckily, minus 0.75 is easy to fix, with the Exmer laser. Thanks for watching.